All right. Thank you very much. Cool. I, uh, gosh, I, when I heard that Scott was going to do the, uh, the dictation automatic thing, I was like, I don't know if that's going to work. That totally worked. Did we not think that was amazing? Seriously, much respect. I am very uncomfortable. I actually, when I heard he was going to do that yesterday, I asked if I could go first, because I thought that was going to be really awesome, and it turned out really great. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, JavaScript, some thoughts that I've got around virtual machines and the cloud. Uh, I do work for Microsoft. Um, but I do work in Portland on the, on the forest moon, uh, which is safely outside the Redmond reality distortion field. Uh, but I work in open source, too, which is awesome. Um, and when I went to work at Microsoft, people thought I was selling out because I came from the open source community. And I'm going to go work for the man. And they were saying I was a pretty bad person. And it was really difficult <laughs> to comfort myself at this time. But somehow, I worked through it. Because before Microsoft was a very interesting time for me. But it turns out that there's a lot of money up there. And being working for Microsoft is really, really great. So I really recommend it for anyone who wants to sell out. Uh, please come and work on, uh, on Bob or Windows the Ocho. <laughs> so I want to talk about some ideas that I've got around the cloud and the browser. I want to tell you a couple of stories. And this is all true uh, stories. All of these stories that I'm telling you are completely true, except for the ones that are totally lied and made up. Um, I was at Intel. Uh, and I gave a presentation, and afterwards, this person came up to me, and this was a, like a distinguished engineer. Distinguished engineers at Intel are basically the people at Intel that have been there so long that they just keep showing up, right? And then the paychecks just keep coming. They get like a million bucks just to be old. And uh, this particular individual had been there like 40 years. He'd been there like since the beginning of Intel. He's like employee number 27 or something like that. This gentleman was what they call a neckbeard. And I want to make sure that it's clear that neckbeard is a gender nonspecific thing. If you do anything in software computing for 40 years, you're immediately a neckbeard. I don't care what you look like. And he came up, and this is someone who uh, has probably forgotten more about software than I will ever know. So there's a certain amount of pressure because he's, you know, he's down here and I'm up here on the stage, which makes me, uh, you know, a better person. And. Uh, <laughs> So he says, I want to learn web development. I'm like, well, I mean, I, you figured you just knew everything, right? And he's like, well, I've been doing low-level work, microcode. You know, I worked on the Pentium and you know, all that kind of stuff. Now I'm ready to become a web developer. And I was like, well, what do you know about the web? And he's like, well, I've got a Rocket Mail account. <laughs> this was my dad, effectively, right? This is who I'm talking to. Now understand that the, 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 the dichotomy here, he's effectively my dad from a computer user perspective but he knows more about processors and computers than I'll ever know. So I've got to be very, very careful in how I'm going to explain this to him. You know what I mean? You, you don't want to be like, well, go to the start menu. and pre But maybe you do. You know, I don't know. So I said, well, let's, let's talk about what do you want to do? I want to be a web developer. And then I realized that this was an opportunity. I could teach someone how to be a web developer in 2014, how to think about web development and architecture in 2014, because he missed the tribulations. He missed all the one pixel GIFs and all the nested tables. He skipped out on all the crappy parts. And he's dropping into a really, really interesting time on the web, both on the client side and on the server side. So this guy, uh, Thomas J. Watson, like, kind of theoretically or legendarily said that he thinks that there's a world market for maybe five computers. Now, we don't know if he actually said this. This is one of those quotes you just can't be sure of. You know, uh, Abraham Lincoln famously said the thing about quotes on the internet is that you can't be sure of their veracity. <laughs> so I don't know if this person said this or not. So I don't even have a picture of him. Uh, but I do have uh, this really old book. So we'll just say that that's the guy. <laughs> so he said, there's a world market for five computers. Now, when he was said that, he was thinking there'd be like a computer, like, it was like, like a game of risk. There'd be like a computer per continent. 
and you would like, you'd send your batch job over to the South American computer and it would do its job. And that was the idea. He never expected that we'd have pocket supercomputers that we would use to argue with strangers on the internet and look at pictures of cats. Um, but this actually happened. There are actually five computers. There's the Amazon computer and the Google computer and the Azure computer and the Rackspace computer. They're these, these big giant batch computers, these infinite refrigerators in the sky actually happened, uh, except they just don't look like refrigerators. Now, this is a picture of the Azure cloud uh, that I work on, and I realize that we're a little behind. I also realized when I talked to my boss, uh, I didn't want to tell him, but do you know that Azure is the color of a cloudless sky? Uh, so, yeah. But we have color, uh, which is awesome. Uh, and we're upgrading machines as fast as we can to get them to uh, the level that you guys expect. He's pretty happy. <laughs> Actually, no, I'm sorry. He's pretty happy. <laughs> Super nice guy. So uh, I'm talking about this guy about uh, the, what it meant to have the cloud. And he said that when he wanted a virtual machine at Intel, he had to fax a guy in IT and wait a week, and that's how he got virtual machines. Now, I remember, as an old guy, uh, that I'm old, uh, that when I wanted to get more machines, I had to go down to PC Micro Center, and my boss thought the cloud was telling me to scale the system, me working the weekend, and then him coming in on Monday, the system had scaled, and he's like, wow, the cloud is awesome. I love the power of the cloud, work, making you work all weekend. That was the cloud for me. So I thought about how am I going to explain this to this gentleman. So I said, all right, let's think about it in a computer science perspective. You know, th these are the components that we learn about in school that represent uh, an operating system. An operating system has to have memory management and security, has to have APIs, has to have threading. These are the things. If you have these things, you are an operating system. Well, now we know about virtual machines. Virtual machines are fabulous. You can put them in your data center. You can move them to some other data center. You can switch from one cloud to another. Virtual machines are super fun, except when you have to fax uh, to get one. And uh, on, the, on the Azure side, I explained to him that you could even run Linux in Azure, which he thought was really insane. He's like, why would you allow that? Like, why is that OK that the Windows people would let Linux run in Azure? And I said, well, <laughs> what do you think it's running on? <laughs> I don't care. We win anyway. You run whatever you want. You run a bunch of Minecraft servers in Azure. I don't care. We're still going to bill you for it. Uh, you can run all of these things. So I said, well, you have to fax. Uh, that really sucks uh, to be you. Uh, what you could do is do uh, one of these things. This is actually kind of cool. This is a uh, thing from Microsoft OpenTech. This is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of virtual machines in the cloud uh, that are all from the community. I could go and say, here's an Ubuntu VM. I want a deployment script. And I'm going to bring this in. So here's the script that they're writing for me. I'll put that into Notepad. And this is saying, go and write, use the Azure command line. Uh, I don't know if I have a, uh, what should I call it? Uh, super poopy. It could, it could be already a super poopy. So that's why you have to have <laughs> the, the two. You just can't really be sure. That looks like an awesome password. Yeah, hang on. That's better. <laughs> so I'm going to use the Azure command line. And the Azure command line is awesome because it's representative of Microsoft not being evil. And that's because we have ASCII art, <laughs> which um, is awesome. So yeah, watch out for that. Uh, so if I type Azure VM create, it's going to go and look up the community image. And it's going to make a cloud service. And it's going to spin up this thing. And I can go and write a couple more lines, and I can go and create a farm of Linux machines just in a few minutes. Uh, this blew his mind. He thought that was amazing. He's like, that's awesome. I love that you can do that. And then there's no faxing involved. The other thing that I said, well, that's infrastructure as a system. But you want to learn about the internet, not at the low level. You know, I told him about how I used to go to PC Micro Center and buy dips and dims and put the, you know, like, I had four megabytes of RAM. 
that was a lot of memory, and I had to put in each chip one at a time. That was awesome. But I don't want to think about that. I don't want to think about the hardware. I don't want to think about the little details. Uh, I met this really cool guy named Adrian Cockroft, who's the um, chief of cloud at Netflix. I'm not sure what his title is, but he's English, which is awesome. Uh, when you meet the guy, you, he's like plus two charisma. He's like, oh, no, I'm from Netflix. Oh, my God. You're like, Netflix, boom, boom, plus two charisma. He's English, plus two charisma. Looks like uh, Anderson Cooper. This guy can do no wrong. Uh, he just shows up. And I, was in, and I was in Europe, right? So he comes up. He gives his presentation. He's amazing. He's English. I come up. I'm in Europe. I'm an American. Look like an American. Talk like an American. I, just, I started out with like an F. And I was just like, America. That's what they heard. <laughs> nothing that I said, nothing that I said could have been awesome after this guy. So he's talking about how the guys at Netflix were moving their Amazon instances from uh, spinning rust, uh, regular hard drives, uh, over to SSDs. And he was talking about IOPS, right? 500 IOPS, uh, input operations, input op uh, output operations, for spinning rust versus 3,000 for SSDs. And he goes and explains the whole thing, and he talks about all the business decisions and stuff. And then he says, are there any questions? And this kid comes up, and you know, God bless the 20-year-old, but uh, he, he, he was like, yeah, I mean, actually, um, you know, SSDs have, this is how I presume that he talked. He was Danish, though, but actually, SSDs have you know, a very high failure rate. Have you thought about some of the, you know, the trim command, you know, BIOS updates? And he gives a whole thing. And again, this guy's got a PhD in stuff I don't understand. And this kid had the, you know, the mushugana to even talk to him. And he just, like a proper Englishman, just took the entire thing. And you know, blah, 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 blah. And he's basically saying, what are you doing with SSDs? What if they die? They fail, blah, 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 blah. I've had pers he's like, I've had three SSDs fail. And he pauses for a second, and he says, well, I don't care. I'm renting them. That's Amazon's problem. That's so cool! <laughs> the best part, the kid didn't even know he'd been cut. It was like a samurai movie where like, it was like phew, And his head was sliding off his neck at a diagonal angle, and he had no idea that was happening. The only thing that would have made it better would have been if Cockcroft was just like <laughs> Netflix, son! What, what? But he was English, so he would never do that. And, and he had a lavalier mic, so he couldn't have dropped the mic, but you can imagine how it would have been awesome. What was cool about that was the fact that Cockroft was explaining the level of abstraction that you sit at when you're in the cloud. He doesn't care. He's renting them. He trashes his hotel room every night. <laughs> Just mess it up because it's going to be beautiful the next day. <laughs> he was talking about how when they moved from Europe, from US to Europe, it was like, push the button. It was like a, you know, Cassandra, push a button, boom. Oh, we just deployed Europe. I'm going to lunch. That's awesome. That's so badass. That's the cloud. So I'm trying to explain this, the, the, the power of that, and the idea of infrastructure as a service is cool, but platform as a service is deeply cool. Hotel rooms that you can trash are awesome. When did scale become a slider bar? That's awesome. I can go like this down to the command line. Let's go in here. And I could say Azure Site Create Super Poopy 3 uh, Location East US dash dash git. And I've got a bunch of webby, webby files in this folder here. And I'm going to go off and not make a virtual machine, but make a site. I'm renting a hotel, and I have no idea what is going on uh, underneath it. And I really don't need to think about that. It's not a uh, detail. Now I'm going to say git add rent. And then I'm going to talk to him for about 20 minutes about the tragedy of line feeds and carriage returns and how we're still thinking about that, even though the IBM Selectric typewriter is no longer in use. And then I will say git commit. Mm. And then, sorry, there we go. Uh, and then I will say git push Azure master. And then I will do that. And then that will go super poopy. 
Now I lose my command line. Ah! <laughs> mm. <laughs> Somehow Windows 8 is to blame here. Holy crap, what the hell's going on? Did I minimize that? Oh man. Pressure's on. Did Super Poopy actually deploy? Will Scott recover from this demo fail? Does he have any idea where his command line is? Does the internet work here? How can I let them know I have no inner monologue? Ah, Super Poopy 3 lives. Yes. Pause for effect. Yes. No, don't applaud. I don't need your pity. <laughs> <laughs> so what's cool about this site isn't that I just did a git deploy, but rather that this is actually HTML, classic ASP, ASP.NET, Razor, Node.js, PHP, and Web API all in the same web server just because I can. Yes. Um, but that's still not cool. What if I could say Azure Site Mode Standard, which move uh, site scale? I think I have to write a regular expression. Hang on. Um, there we go. That just made it on its own virtual machine. Azure Site Scale Instances 3. And that just created a server farm and made it load balanced. So now I have three virtual machines in the cloud running that, that whole site. So this is when you then go and work from home. Because <laughs> right? it's really hard. He's like, oh, I'm going to really oh, I mean, configure the load balancer. Yeah, we're going to need to get a guy to come in from F5 to do that for us. Um, yeah, I'm going to go and work at Panera for about three days. <laughs> I'm billing the whole time, right? There's, just, there's no way that I'm going to type Azure Site Scale and have my boss actually see that I can do that. That's a huge problem. He's just, just happened. <laughs> now, a good cloud. It uh, doesn't care about language choice. You know, that's what's great about Azure and Amazon and things like that. They don't care about language choice. This gentleman was saying, well, what language should I learn to become a web developer? And I was like, I don't care. Whatever language makes you happy. Any good cloud doesn't care. He says, well, I know a lot about C++. And I was like, except for that one. Um, <laughs> But in all seriousness, you can use whatever thing you want. You know, we've got all the different things. You can write C++ in Azure if you want to. You can do Node, PHP, Python, all the different things you want to do. It's all open source and on GitHub, and all the SDKs are free. And he thought that was really cool. He's like, an open cloud, that's awesome. That's not creepy at all. Um, you know, and, and lots of stuff are open source. He liked open source. He doesn't, he doesn't really think, he's an older gentleman, so he doesn't really think about licensing and stuff. He just wants the source to be available. And I said, yeah, just go to GitHub. All the SDKs, Ruby, um, the Ruby SDK, Node SDK, PHP, it's all open source. It's great. ASP.NET, it's all open source now, in case you hadn't heard. Uh, this is a list just of all of the things in Visual Studio that we use that are open source. Look at all that jQuery right there. We could have just said jQuery, but instead we broke it out into plugins, too, just to make sure that it filled up the slide. Um, and even Iron Python. If you want to use Iron Python, you know, that's on you. I don't really, you know, there's no judgment, but that's cool. <laughs> but he says he was a C++ developer, and he likes to do things at the command line. He says, well, I know how to write, you know, public static void main. And I was like, well, OK. You know, I said, I want to do batch work. I want to do batch work. He says, I want to do stuff like these kids at the New York Times did. I mean, if you heard about this, the kids at the New York Times, there were some interns, and they had terabytes and terabytes of TIFF files, 135-odd years of the New York Times in TIFF format. They were told to OCR it, resize it, convert it into PDFs, combine them all, and then you know, spit it out the other side. Classic batch job. So they needed to go and do that once at the command line. Right? And then they needed to scale that. And this is a classic 
yak shaving problem. Are you familiar with the yak shaving? Anyone use that term? Is that like a thing that we say? No? Did I just make that up? Pretty sure I didn't. Um, I'm shocked that no one knows what yak shaving is. Okay. So, boss says, hey, can you convert these terabytes of things into, um, uh, in, into PDFs? And you go and you write a little shell script or a Python script. Drop the mic. Decent shirt. Did I break it? Does it work? Hello. So you go and you write your little command line application to go and do that work. And then the boss is like, that's great. Now do it n times, where n is a really big number. Right? And then you're like, how would you do that? And like, a for loop? Well, and then it turns out that it doesn't work that way because there's terabytes of stuff and it would take until the, you know, the sun death of the universe to to do it, and then your boss says that the schedule is not going to work for him. <laughs> so, so you say, well, give me some money and I'll use the cloud. Well, then you got to go and you got to log into the cloud system and configure the virtual machine and then come up with a multi-processor strategy and a multi-threading strategy and a concurrency. You got to chop up the job into different reasonable pieces, come up with, what about bad actors? That's yak shaving. Okay, I can totally do that, boss, but just hang on. Before I get on that business problem, I need to shave this yak. <laughs> yak shaving is getting all the stuff ready to do the stuff that you really want to do. Yak shaving is reinstalling your operating system. Yak shaving is setting up all the grunt stuff and the rake files and all that crap that has nothing to do with the fact that the boss said do this. Now, we're brainstorming about a couple of ideas to make yak shaving less of a problem, and this is an example of one of them. It's a little bit um, small, so I'll zoom for you all. Let's imagine that you had some main like this, just some application. It's, it th does some stuff, resizes images, does some processing, doesn't really matter what it does. Uh, this is the kind of app that the gentleman at Intel says he knew how to write. In this case here, this just reads in uh, a text and then writes out, I ran in the cloud, and then adds the line of text. So you've got like input and output. So I said, now put that in the cloud and run it on 100 nodes in parallel. Now we've got to shave the yak, right? So here's the idea that we've come up with. What if you could go like this, put attributes on the inputs into the function, just as it is, no SDKs or anything, just a couple of marker attributes, and then upload that into the cloud, and then it's slider bar time. We're going to automatically call that function n times for any blob that matches that input. Make sense? You just put this DLL up in the cloud or this script up in the cloud, and then you say slider bar. How much money do you have? Turns out that the folks at the New York Times, when they did their work in Amazon, it cost them 300 bucks to do that which is really awesome. And then I actually, I've been telling this story for a while, and some guys came up to me afterwards and says, well, it turns out it was 150 bucks, but we had to run it twice. <laughs> That's awesome. That's the cloud, right? That's the promise of the cloud. For something like this, the, uh, we're calling this Azure Web Jobs, and this is the idea that you could go and do something in the cloud end times, and we'll handle the complexity of the work. He thought that was really attractive. Now, these are all server-side things. He needed to think about also the client side. But I was going to take this opportunity to express the client side in a different way than I had in the past. Because most people think of the client side as being a dumb terminal. And he thought about it like that too, right? The client side has been dumb for years, which is ironic because Intel has been trying to think of things for the client to do to sell more processors for years. Like just anything at all that could burn up processors. They have a whole division there that just wastes CPU so that you could buy more CPUs. So I came back to this diagram and I said, well, here are the, the things, the ingredients that one needs for an operating system, right? You need to have memory management, blah, 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 blah. Well, there was a time when you would sit down in front of a computer like this and type some stuff, and the real work would happen in this computer in the back. The refrigerator on the right does the work. And then you would get this user interface that would come, oops, hang on. There we go. You would get this user. <laughs> You would get this user interface that would come from that machine, and then you would display it on that screen, and you would feel like you were sitting in front of, like you were in the seat of power. You know, but it was a dumb terminal. It didn't really do anything at all. And then the web came along. And this actually is the, uh, the first web page. You know that? This is the first one. This is the beginning of the web. If your kids or anyone of your non-technical uh, non relatives says, show me the very, 
Oh, hang on. I have been postponing this for a year. I'm also apparently a victim of uh, software piracy, I'm told, about four times a day. This is the beginning of the internet. And what's great about this is that the URL for this page has not changed. Like, the first page in the internet is still there. And when Tim Berners-Lee and friends decided to come up with this, they were thinking about, let's move you know, scientific documents around. Let's push physics-type stuff and math equations around. They weren't really thinking about an application platform. Uh, and actually, funny story about this, uh, there's this guy at work uh, named Heinrich. And I, I met him. I, I go up to Seattle every month. And I was hanging out in the water cooler. And hey, Heinrich, I'm Heinrich. Hey, Heinrich, how are you, Heinrich? Blah, blah. Then he leaves. And then my buddy's like, did you know who that was? OK, like this is not going to go well for me. That's Heinrich. Um, he, wrote, he wrote HTTP. Like, what, the hell, what am I supposed to do with that? Like, that little, that the diminutive little nice man named Heinrich wrote HTTP. Like, no, come on. So I go and I look up the HTTP spec, you know, because I'm always on the toilet reading the HTTP spec. First name, Heinrich. His name is on the spec for HTTP. Completely ruined this man for me now. I can't talk to the guy. I can't look at him. I'm just like, as soon as I see him coming, I'm just, I turn into Rain Man. I'm just like, definitely, definitely header, definitely HTTP header. Good, good job on the web. <laughs> What do, you, what do you say to someone like that? He's a totally nice guy. And he like invented the internet with his, he was Tim Berners-Lee's intern. I don't know if that makes him the Holy Ghost or Jesus or something, but it's really important and I have to respect that. And that's awesome. So anyway, I'm afraid to talk to Heinrich now. So the web was meant to be documents pushing around and then this happened. And we knew that this happened because we visited a web page and and there was a pause. The entire internet paused for just a moment while Java loaded. And then we were like, we can do it too! Whee! <laughs> and then these guys are like, we've got YouTube! We're still relevant! Blah, blah, blah. What was the business problem that was trying to be solved here? The problem was we wanted virtual machines. We wanted virtual machines that would run in the browser because the web wasn't cutting it. Say what you will about Java, say what you will about Silverlight and things like that, and Flash or Future Wave, as I like to call it. Uh, no one remembers that because you all are very young. Uh, remember Future Splash? Anyone? Any Future Splash developers? No? People? No one remembers? Thank you, old guy in the back. <laughs> but when, f what, what Flash was before it became Flash, before Adobe and Macromedia, future Splash animator? Shockwave, yeah? No? OK. Forget you guys. Get off my lawn! I'm old! Um, these virtual machines are pushing the web forward, right? People are upset. People are like, hey, Scott, you work for Microsoft. Why did Microsoft kill Silverlight? We didn't kill Silverlight. Internet did, right? It pushed it forward. It did stuff. Silverlight was great. Java was great. Did stuff the internet could not do until the internet totally could do that. It's like when you're a kid, you know, you're, you're teaching your kid, like, oh, you're a little great little kid. Then he's 15, he kicks your ass, and then you're just an old dude. That's what happened to Silverlight. He's, Sorry, the internet's growing up. Now you're just an old dude. But it was amazing, and it was an operating system in the browser. Now, I went to Toyota recently. I have a Prius, because I work, I, I live in, in Portland, and we're given Prius uh, on birth. And um, pre I. Uh, so I go in to get my car looked at, and they usually have this terminal system. They terminal in, they VT100 into the AS400 in the back. Okay? And uh, it's really great. I mean, text mode is where it's at. I mean, if you want to tab, 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 enter, text mode, right? And that's why it's done at the airport. And um, he says, we've got a new system now. So I need to get used to this new system. And I'm always fascinated at how these things work. So he says, let me boot up the new system. So he fires up Windows XP. And I'm like, oh. And he fires up Firefox. I'm like, hmm. And then he then visits a web page. Man I don't know why he has to manually load a jar file, load Java. Java then's like, are you really sure you want to run Java? And he's like, allow. 
And then they're like, no, we're really not going to let you use Java. And he's like, unblock. And then they're like, you know, the United States government has determined that Java is a bad idea. Are you sure? Type, I'm totally sure this is a bad idea, and I'm going to do it anyway. So he types that. And he loads a jar file, which is a terminal emulator, and then terminals back to the system in the back that's the AS400. <laughs> and then looks at me with a straight face and says, this is a way better system than before. <laughs> that is not the promise of a plug-in virtual machine. That is not why we did that. That is bad. You don't want to have a document on the left and then this island of uh, machine in the corner. It doesn't make any sense. It's useless. It's only good for teapots and physics demos. It provides no value at all. <laughs> that is true. Yeah. Um, so then this starts happening. This starts happening. And it's not this. It's, it's something called live script. And all you can do is say, alert pwned. That's basically all you can do with JavaScript at this point. You can type it into a text box and then go, pwned, oh, you got me. It's a toy, and we're not even thinking about it, right? But then I remember the very first time that JavaScript impressed me. I think that we can all remember this. And it almost always is a story like we were working on something and doing a form, and then I went to this other website. I was filling out this form. I typed in my email, and I hit tab, and it told me my email was wrong, and it didn't refresh the page. Remember that moment? And you're just like, how do they do that? I must view source. You know? So then you immediately view source, and then you're like, holy crap. And then you run to your boss, and you're like, boss, they just did something without posting back. Boss does not care. So then you run, and then you tell, then you tell, uh, then you run home, and you tell gender, gender nonspecific, non-technical spouse. And you're like, hey, gender nonspecific, non-technical spouse. This did just updated the form, and it did not post back. And he, she is like, I still don't care. <laughs> so then you try to make it happen on your own computer, and you view source, and you code it up, and you hack it up, and then, and then it works, and you hit tab, and then you go, and you look around, and still no one cares. <laughs> and you find yourself questioning, is JavaScript a toy? Is this really something that we can do stuff with? This is the flow chart that represents working with JavaScript on a daily basis. <laughs> That's courtesy of my friend Leon Bambrick. And then people start doing weird stuff with JavaScript to prove that it can be done. Like this. This is oops, a complete Commodore 64 emulator in JavaScript because the internet. <laughs> and of course, you have to, whenever you see something like this, you have to right click on it to make sure it's not Flash because that's cheating. <laughs> Anytime anyone shows you anything cool, you have to right click on it. And if it says Flash, you're just like, you suck! It's cheating. What's wrong with you? Come to me with that crap. Just swat it to the ground. Just swat their MacBook to the ground. Say, I don't think so. <laughs> it's not pure JavaScript. You'll plug in person. What's wrong with you? Coming to me with your flash demos and you're trying to impress me. This is a complete Linux emulator emulating an x86 and a complete build of Linux running entirely in JavaScript. This is real, JS Linux. And that would be cool. But it would be cooler to go and compile a C app with a C compiler in Linux, in JavaScript, in the browser on my Windows machine, because that would be awesome. But that would not be deeply awesome. What would be deeply awesome would be to run an iPhone simulator and then load mobile Safari, and then inside that load Linux, and then inside that <laughs> load uh, a C compiler, and then compile that, and then say, uh, hello world from C in JavaScript, because that would be awesome. Oh my god, that's amazing. Um, 
This is kind of crazy. Have you seen this? This was the iPad game of the year, 2011. See these things? This is my fingers. This is my nose. The, the, the guy who wrote this iPad app would not let the, the team put this out unless it was pixel perfect. Look at the, the grass. So whenever a boss says, I don't know if this is a good idea, I don't think we can do this in HTML, I show them stuff like that. And then when they're total jerks uh, and they say that I don't think that it's, it's possible, I show them this, which we talked a little bit about which is awesome. Now, this is a crappy uh, Ultrabook that I've got here. It's not a particularly impressive laptop. It weighs three pounds and locks up a lot. But other than that, it's unexceptional. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure which thing is better. Uh, so this is uh, Firefox, and it's telling me to wait. And this is awesome. But how awesome is it? Menu, menu, menu. Ah. There we go. So on a mediocre laptop, I'm doing 60 frames a second in a JavaScript written Unreal engine, which is awesome. And uh, there we go. And that's, of course, uh, the taking C++ through Clang, and it's creating this, uh, this lightweight virtual machine bytecode that gets run through mscripten, and then asm.js, and then turns into JavaScript. And it's amazing. That is C++ to JavaScript. Now, the guy at Intel thought this was hot. He thought this was ridiculous. This was fabulous. Then I even uh, consider showing him some of the early builds of, uh, let's see if I can bring this up some of the early builds of uh, Windows 9 written entirely in, uh, in JavaScript. It's extremely metro. <laughs> it's pretty subtle. There you go. <laughs> All done in JavaScript, people. Future Windows. Lots of amazing virtual machines have proven the point that you can do virtual machines inside virtual machines. You got to think about this for a second, though, because you're running a browser in user mode that's running JavaScript, which is itself an operating system. JavaScript is an operating system. Then you're emulating another operating system underneath that. Here I've taken those things we talked about before, memory management, storage, and security, and then I added on top of them some of the things that are uh, characteristics of JavaScript. So you want memory management, we've got garbage collection, asm.js has some amazing memory management stuff. You want storage, we've got lots of choices for that. Graphics, well, you can have 3D or 2D, you've got lots of choices for graphics. All of these characteristics of JavaScript match up. JavaScript is a virtual machine, it is an operating system. And Atwood's law, of course, says that any app that can be written in JavaScript will eventually be written in JavaScript. Now, this is true. This is totally true. But it actually also was true of Microsoft Excel, uh, which probably is an operating system as well. Uh, this is a complete implementation of Pac-Man written entirely in Excel, where each pixel is a single cell. <laughs> because internet. <laughs> Every single one of those is a cell, people. Yeah, no joke. And this is actually such an amazing and complete emulation that it cannot be stopped. <laughs> yeah, there is literally no way to stop this. Um, so that's a problem. You should have, actually, uh, uh, speaking of not responding, you should have seen my, uh, my Halloween costume last year. I went as Microsoft Excel. I took a shower curtain and I put like this opaque shower curtain in front of me and I just said not responding and I just went to parties and refused to speak to anyone. <laughs> so let's see if we can get out of this. Now this, yeah, that one hurt. There we go. 
Now, your phone, of course, has two operating systems, like we just said. There's the operating system it ships with, and then there's the one inside the browser. And that one, that one is only going to be as great as the owner of the phone is going to let it be. You know? uh, I, don't, I don't know why Mobile Safari isn't giving us the full power of the JavaScript engine on their, uh, outside of Mobile Safari in things like Cordova, but we'll see. Now, this guy says that betting on HTML5 was a mistake. And that they, you know, they went and they rewrote the whole Facebook app. Remember how face, when Facebook uh, sucked uh, more? Uh, then they rewrote the whole thing over again, and they said, "Yeah, you know, HTML5 is clearly not ready." But then the Sencha folks went and wrote their stuff entirely in Sencha, and it was awesomer than native, which shows that awesome programmers are awesome programmers. And then there are the people who work at Facebook. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, I'm playing. The point is this. HTML5 is going to happen. One of our great philosophers said that the avalanche has already begun. It is too late for the pebbles to vote. The mountain's coming down. The pebbles are like, I don't really know how I feel about this avalanche. Let's talk about that. Sorry, HTML5 is going to happen, Mark Zuckerberg. You can suck it up, because it's going to happen. Now, anyone know which of our famous philosophers said that? Anyone want to guess? Lincoln? No? Is it Kierkegaard, maybe? Dick Van Patten? No? It was Kosh from Babylon 5. What is wrong with you people? You call yourselves a room of nerds. You're not nerds. You're managers. You are scrum masters. I spit on your scrum if you don't know who Kosh from Babylon 5 is. What's wrong with you? It's Ambassador Kosh. Now, we keep saying HTML5, HTML5, and all this kind of stuff, and JavaScript and CSS, but really it's, just, it's this family of things. Now, HTML in the back in the day was complicated. I used to, I used to personally teach five day long, 40 hour a week classes on HTML. You know what I'm talking about. I used to be able to walk into anywhere with a hole in my jeans and say, I need a job. Do you know, do you know tables? <laughs> I do know tables. <laughs> Boom, junior engineer. Do you know Rosepan? <laughs> I do know Rosepan. Yeah, senior engineer. <laughs> That's e how easy it was to get a job in the Bay back in the day. You throw a rock, you hit a homeless guy, he knows how to do tables. So boom, you're hired. What was great about this also is that I know, and you only know this from experience, uh, that the maximum number of nested tables on Netscape 4 was 32. And the only way that you learn that the number is 32 is when you write the 33rd table. <laughs> and you write it without shame, because it needed to be done. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes, I did. Yeah. But today, HTML, there's really nothing. There's like nothing to it. HTML5 is really non-existent. Uh, check this out. This is a really great thing at CSS Deck, where we have uh, the creation of an iPhone. These are like um, screencasts, except they're not screencasts. They are done entirely in, in CSS. So you can select them, see? You can right click and it doesn't say flash. Um, this is not a movie. They're actually doing it in the browser. So you're watching this gentleman type. And as he's doing it, look what's happening over here. He is drawing an, uh, an iPhone has to be valid before it draws. There you go. Without using any PNGs, he's going to get a pixel-perfect iPhone using only CSS. Now, how much uh, HTML did he end up using? <laughs> yeah, that HTML5 is amazing, isn't it? That's uh, really fantastic. You can do a lot with HTML these days. HTML is really the structure. It just hangs around. It's back to the way it was when Berners-Lee said, hey, this is this document. We created a bunch of stuff around it to make it an application platform. Right? CSS provides the color and the style. And CSS is awesome. We love CSS. <laughs> Working with CSS is highly intuitive and very comfortable. And we all feel like every time we do something in CSS, we get exactly what we want from the CSS engine. The spec is clear and precise. And And then you write JavaScript for everything else. And the great thing about JavaScript, uh, even though it sucks profoundly, uh, is that you only have to read about the good parts. <laughs> now, once upon a time, another great philosopher said that JavaScript is the assembly language of the web. Do anyone know who said that? You. I did say that. Thank you. 
That's right, I said that. Now, with every good quote, it's very likely stolen from Lincoln. Um, and I can't take credit for it, because anytime any comes, anyone comes up with a good quote, see, look at the paparazzi. Um, anytime anyone comes, there's an action shot for you there, brother. Anytime anyone comes up with a quote, there was someone who said it before. Now, when I said that, it got on Reddit, and it was a whole thing. And then I started to question myself. I'm like, I kind of think it was, you know. I made a declarative statement on the internet. I didn't think anyone was going to argue with me. Uh, so it became like a whole thing. And someone was wrong on the internet, and it was a problem, and I was up late. So then I emailed some of the people who made JavaScript to ask them if this was in fact true to get my back. So I emailed Crockford, and I emailed Brendan Eich, and it was like, hey, am I off base here? Okay. Um, and Brendan Eich emailed me back, and he, he said, that's actually Brendan Fraser. Uh, who is a good-looking man. Uh, that's Brendan Eich. So Brendan Eich said, I said JavaScript is the x86 of the web a couple years ago, but he can't claim it's original, thus proving that I was the first one to say it, and it was an awesome idea. No, he's proving that the idea was always out there, and of course, duh, yes, right? Now. Even now, we're starting to use JavaScript as a, as a compilation target or as a trans compilation target. Here, you've got an example of CoffeeScript, where we've got CoffeeScript on the left here turning into reasonably idiomatic JavaScript on the right. And CoffeeScript is what a Rubyist wishes JavaScript was. It's their projection of JavaScript. It's their they want that haiku, they want that indentation, they want the terseness, the clarity, the expressiveness. That's what they want. TypeScript is what a C-sharp person wishes JavaScript was. They want classes and interfaces, and they want to write what looks like idiomatic C-sharp and get the exact same JavaScript on the right there. And people have opinions about this stuff, but it doesn't matter. Because if the stuff on the right is clear and idiomatic JavaScript, what do you care? Right? It's not like it's uh, GWT or something. Right? It's not like it's just generating something that you can't maintain. You could throw away the left side and keep moving on the right side if you wanted to. So that's great. People are turning JavaScript into things that it isn't and trying to embrace it and bring it into their C Sharp world or their Ruby world or their Python world or whatever. And that's totally cool. Um, at the same time, though, we don't want layers to hide too much complexity. I think that, uh, as the jQuery conference can probably attest to, that there has been a time when people le leaned on jQuery too much, you, where you'd have someone come in for an interview and you'd ask them, can you go and select something in CSS, and they'd do it, and then you'd say, can you do it without jQuery, and they'd just freeze up because they can't do it. And you have to ask yourself, how deep do you want to go? Is that okay? Is it okay to someone to be a jQuery-only developer? Uh, my wife has uh, more degrees than I do, uh, like many more, because I don't have any. Um, and she has like a master's degree, and she's forgotten more about finance than I'll ever remember. And she speaks like four or five languages, and I don't, you know, I speak American. And, uh, but she lost her wedding ring down the drain. It disappeared, it, 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 it exited the universe and went into an alternate parallel reality uh, through a wormhole and became inaccessible to her because it was it's the drain, dear. It's not coming out. Now, you can tell by my strapping appearance that I'm extremely handy. Uh, I win all my bar fights. And uh, more of a slap fighter, but still. Uh, you can tell that I probably have lots of tools at home. Uh, but my wife looked at me in all of my masculine glory and said, uh, should I call your dad? <laughs> and I said, stop bringing him up. I can do this. I'm, I'm handy. Uh, so I went underneath the sink to the curvy thing. <laughs> and I kind of beat on it for a while. <laughs> Give me the ring. Uh, so I pulled the curvy thing out. I don't know what it's called. Uh, don't tell me what it's called. It's going to make me handy. It's called the trap. Thank you very much for making me handy now. Yeah. So I actually went to Home Depot, and then I consulted with someone. And then I came back, and I pulled the thing out. And I pulled the ring out. And from my wife's perspective, I reached across space and time into the wormhole and retrieved from the parallel universe 
the evil Spock version of her ring with a little tiny goatee and handed it to her and said, this is amazing, here's your ring. And she said, you are such an awesome person, that's amazing. And you must, when did you, how did you learn plumbing? And I said, well, I, I only know from the curvy thing to the wall, and then there's a wormhole that leads into a parallel dimension. <laughs> I just knew one layer down in the call stack, more than she did. But one layer down in the call stack is indistinguishable from magic. <laughs> right? So do I need to know everything and every single detail about the internals of JavaScript? No. But I should probably know what a CSS selector does, and if I didn't have jQuery, how to do it. That's the equivalent of digging this thing out of the trap. Because you don't necessarily want to have these layers hide complexity from you. Because you might think that you're slick and you know what you're doing, but then you're not. <laughs> Boom! Because no one writes JavaScript anymore, right? They write jQuery. Who said that? No, that was actually jQuery. <laughs> but thank you for that. That was, uh, that was the American actor, jQuery. And the great thing about learning about uh, jQuery's uh, body of work is that you will never be able to say jQuery again. I've ruined the word for you all. Literally, all day long, you're going to think about jQuery every time that you say jQuery. And what's great about actor jQuery is if you look at his body of work that you're probably uh, familiar with, like uh, the one time he was on Chicago Fire, uh, Escape from Polygamy was pretty awesome, <laughs> Fred the Show, and Night of the Living Fred, and Camp Fred, where he played Kevin. And I don't know what that is. So you can see that jQuery is going places. And pretty soon jQuery is going to show up in Google above jQuery. And then there's going to be a problem. And we're going to have to rename the whole thing. You think you're going to build something amazing in JavaScript. And if you don't really understand, the vision is one thing, and the reality ends up being another thing. And you don't know who to blame. And then you feel sad. And you're like, I don't even know. I don't know what happened. I think one of the things that people need to remember when they're doing work on the client side is that they think that the servers that they have available to them, the computing power they have available to them is on the server side. Hey, we've got four servers in the farm. Hey, now we've got eight. Now we've got 16 servers in the farm. And we've got these people who are visiting us from these dumb terminals, uh, including the uh, quad processor, pocket supercomputer with two gigs of RAM, dumb terminal, uh, that they have in their pockets. So we need to go and send them uh, a table of data. So I'm going to send them that table of data across the wire and then show that table of data. And then at which this point, they are then going to want to sort that table of data. Now, we all know that quad processor two gigabytes of RAM is not enough to sort a list of 10 items. Not nearly enough. And computers aren't really good at sorting or sifting or querying or filtering data. So what we're going to need to do then is save the view state uh, and send that view state back across the wire and then have the computers on the back end, the powerful computers, uh, then regenerate that table and then send that table across the wire. Why don't we send the data? You would be shocked at how often this happens, posting back to sort stuff. Because people say, well, I've got 1,000 items in my list. <laughs> yeah, two gigs of RAM is not going to be able to handle 1,000 items. There's just no way. God forbid you should send the data and actually sort it and have it actually work. Because you don't have 16 machines in your farm. You have 10,000 CPUs plus 16. So if you start thinking about all of those CPUs as being members of your farm, you can start thinking about splitting up the work that they do and making them work harder. You've also got all of these, uh, these standards that are available to you now, which uh, would allow you to create tools uh, that you maybe haven't thought about. 
this is something that we've been working on. Uh, I know a lot of you guys don't necessarily run uh, Visual Studio, but let's just say that you did. Um, I'm going to go ahead and run, let me do this. This is Visual Studio, uh, the free one. And then I'm going to go here, and I'm going to pull down this Chrome thing, and I'm going to say Browse With. And it's going to say, well, Chrome's the default browser. I'm going to hit Explorer, Chrome, and Firefox, and I'm going to set them all as the default browser because internet. And that, at 1,024, that was an awesome idea, too, by the way. So here is all of those. And I'm not going to spend any time at 1,024 resizing these. I'll be, I'm going to be resizing these for about 20 minutes. Hang on. So here are those things. And let me change that. Now, if I come over here into the toolbar and make this a little bigger. Sorry, my, uh, this is on, a, on an angle. If I hover here, it says three browsers are connected. Visual Studio knows that three browsers are calling uh, from us right now. So I'm just going to hit refresh in Visual Studio and then push the refresh out to those kind of things, which is cool. We've seen things like that with auto reload and stuff like that, and that's cool. But that's not deeply cool. What's really deeply cool would be to go and say design, hover over divs, and have it automatically open up the views, JavaScript, Angular, whatever, that created it, and have it select that div and show me what file that was in. That would be cool. But that's still not deeply cool. What would be even cooler would be is if I could just start typing in the browser itself and then push that code back into Visual Studio and have that then sent out to all of the other browsers, which would be cool. But that's still not cool, and you're not applauding, so I'm not going to, I don't want you to try, because if you can't earn it, then it's not worth it, right? So you know how when you hit F12 tools, and then you go and you like change a bunch of CSS elements, and you get it exactly perfect, and then you say, don't move. And then you <laughs> open up your CSS, and then you try to figure out what exactly that you did to make that work, right? <laughs> so what if I could uh, go like this and say F12 auto sync, and then type in a background color like salmon, and as I'm typing it, have it appear in my less or sass or in my CSS on the left-hand side. And while simultaneously change. <laughs> while simultaneously changing on the other browsers. So you like that? So those are the kinds of things that we need to expect from our web tools. We need to expect more from our web tools. These things all work together really nicely. Everything that I just showed you, open source, JavaScript, web sockets, good stuff, works as it should. And it should make you feel really, really good about yourself. <laughs> You've got massive scale and elasticity on the, on the cloud. You've got accelerated graphics, this amazing virtual machine on the browser. You need to let these machines work a little bit harder. You do have unlimited virtual machines on the cloud to the limit of your credit card. But remember that your user has a powerful virtual machine. So put that machine to work. And remember that your cloud doesn't have to work so hard. Uh, I also reminded that this is a particular individual that he's not obsolete. He knows this stuff. He knows machines. He knows computer science. He knows virtual machines. He can get out there and start writing for the web right now. So he felt very powerful uh, after being told this story. Uh, so go and reboot your operating system with F5. Thank you guys very much. Bye-bye.